a spooky topic. Ritual murder libel. What is that? Now I have a lot of a lot of uh, slides, 127. A lot of them are short, but uh, we better get going. Uh, if we can't fin uh, fit them all in, not the end of the world, but let's just do the best we can. Um, and um, Menachem, do you mind uh, start reading? <coughs> no, not at all. Very good. Okay, there were several lethal accusations during the Middle Ages that cost thousands of Jewish lives. Like the host desecration libel, ritual murder libel, a specific type of ritual murder allegation called blood libels and poisoning of the wells libels yeah um, so uh, that caused the black plague yeah 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 so we're only uh, talking today about uh, the middle two ritual murder libel and blood libel which is also a ritual murder libel host desecration libel i have taught in the, in the past but you have to make choices that that's like a weird libel it's like a libel a libel is an accusation right so um it's a fancy word for, for basically accusation. So a host desecration libel means there's a host, there's, a, there's the Catholics have, a, 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 have the notion that when the priest blesses the bread, and it's actually, um, uh, the bread is in the powder, it, it's, it's like, it's not even, it doesn't look like bread, but uh, it's called the host, uh, or the Eucharist, basically. It's what... Uh, what the priest says, uh, this, this is the body of Christ. Now, they believe when they bless that bread, that the host which changes from, from, from um, in a mystical way, from uh, bread, being bread, to the actual body of Christ. Even though it looks like, uh, still like bread, it is actually the actual body of Christ. And the host desecration libel uh, it's based on the idea that Jews uh, are the killers of Jesus and they can't help themselves. They want to kill and slaughter Jesus because that's, that's their nature. They're so evil. And so they would steal a, a consecrated host that is actually the body of Christ and then kill it or stab it. And uh, according to these, uh, to these libels, then the, because it's a miracle, it is really the body of Christ. It starts bleeding. And so, so there's a lot of... Uh, there have been um, cases that people said, oh, you, you stole a host, uh, you stole a, a Eucharist, and you did this, of course, based on nothing, and that entire community has been massacred. But we're not going to go into that. We're going to go to the ritual murder libel. The fourth one, uh, also, we're not really um, going to cover, because there's not really so much right, Jewish Hebrew writings are written based on that. The others uh, have. Now, let's, this is the ritual murder libel. You already see a very juicy picture. This is what people believe that Jews secretly did. Um, let's start. Yeah, yeah, continue. In the minds of many medieval Christians, the Jews were obsessed with the desire to spill the blood of Jesus, to quench that thirst for Christ's blood, so it was believed they would kidnap and murder pure, innocent Christian children and use their blood for their rituals. Yeah, that's a sick idea, but yeah. Right. There were about 150 rec recorded cases of ritual murder and blood libel that resulted in the arrest, of, in the arrest and killing of Jews, besi besides for thousands of rumors. Yeah, people spread the humor more, much more, uh, and luckily not all these cases uh, ended up in killings or murders, but 150 is pretty serious and nonetheless. Ironically, in, in antiquity, Judaism was the first religion in antiquity that turned away from human sacrifice. That turning point is, is described in the Torah, in the story of Abraham, who, who understood that he was ordered to kill his son and then was stopped by God and, present, and presented a ram to offer instead. Mm -hmm. Jewish prophets have preached against human sacrifice in times that the surrounding nations practiced it. Yeah, so uh, that's, if, if anyone, any religion would be against human sacrifice, it would be Jews. Nonetheless, they've been uh, accused of it. The concept of human sacrifice was so alien and repulsive to Jews that this was one of the reasons that the concept of crucifixion as a means towards forgiveness and redemption didn't make sense to them. At least not to most. Mm -hmm. The first known case of such accusations took place in the city of Norwich, then one of the biggest cities in England. The Jewish community was, there wasn't ancient, about 120 years old, but old enough to have roots in the... In 120 the still. I mean, if you live somewhere, that's already like four generations at least. 
So you are uh, rooted. You're an integral part of the community. Uh huh. On March 11:44, a 12-year-old boy, later known as Philip of Norwich, disappeared. Four days later, on the day before Easter or Holy Saturday, his body was found in the woods outside the town. Yeah. So who do you accuse? <clears throat> Quite quickly, the families accused the Jews. Soon enough, the story spread that the Jews had tortured William and crucified him with a crown of thorns and had pierced his side. Yeah, to reenact the crucifixion, basically, right? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Part, of, part of the background is, is found by looking into the historical setting. The, oh, one second. The royalty and nobility of these days were Normans, French-speaking descendants of the Vikings and seen as occupiers. They were the ones who had brought the Jews from France for into from friends for economical reasons. Yeah, a king sometimes needs a, a bank to put, have a loan. Now, you cannot, there were no Christian banks because a bank lives uh, and, and, and exists because they make profit, profit from uh, loans. Well, that was forbidden for Christians. So the only people you could ask uh, to do that were the Jews. So a king needed Jews and that's why these kings imported, so to say, French Jews into England. So, um, that's what happened. The Jews of England also spoke French and were hated as aliens and supporters of the foreign rulers. For safety purposes, they lived close to the castle. Besides, the Jews had brought to England for the besides the Jews had been brought to, the, to England for the purpose of money. A job that triggered a lot of hatred. The year 1144 fell in a period of instability, chaos, and rebellion. Yeah. William of Norwich had made was made into a martyr and saint. A cult developed around him. Miracles, miracles were reported and pilgrims visited the, cap, the chapel over his grave. Right. A certain Thomas of Monmouth wrote a book called The Life and Miracles of William of Norwich, which pumped up the story and made it even more spectacular than it had originally been. The story spread all over the country and beyond. Yeah. A converted Jew by the name of Theobald of Cambridge is reported to have given the following statement. He told Thomas of Monmouth, who, who was writing a book about the event, that there was a written prophecy which states that, which states that the Jews would regain control of Israel if they sacrificed a Christian child each year. Every year, said Theobald, the Jews, Jewish leaders met in, met in Narbonne to decide who would be asked to perform the sacrifice. In 1144, the Jews of Norway were assigned the task. Yeah, I mean... Why would he make that up, right? That's uh, very sad. Of course, people, when they come with such a story and they get a lot of attention, a lot of people do things for attention, I guess. It's the only way I can explain it. Okay. In this first case, there were no casualties as a result. The local sheriff took the juice into the castle until things calmed down. Yeah, he didn't believe it, like these superstitious uh, burgers, uh, pe peasants. So he protected them, but... However, as the story spread, things became nastier and similar stories popped up in different towns, which did lead to massacres. Things got really out of hand in 1089 with the massacre of the Jews of London. Yeah, that was uh, very serious. One year later, in 1190, there was a massacre of York that culminated in a case of collective suicide. Eventually, this outburst of fear and anger towards the Jews led to a complete expulsion of all Jews from England in 1290. Yeah. And, and, and a big, big part due to these, uh, to these uh, stories, yeah. The incident in Norwich had set a dark anti-Jewish tone and even, even rever reverberates in the writing of the father of the English literature uh, by Geoffrey um, Chaucer, who lived from 1343 to 1400. Chaucer, right. Have you heard of Chaucer? Chaucer? Yeah. Not yet. Okay, but oh. so he's one of the oldest uh, first writers that we know. Mm -hmm. Over a hundred years after all Jews had disappeared from British soil, Chaucer, not having met a single Jew in his life, writes in, quote, A Priori's Tale, the Jews, were, the Jews were not satisfied with the blood of Christ. They had to sacrifice more innocent blood running in the veins of Christian children. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the famous Chaucer. Okay. Another incident happened in 1171 in Blois, in Blois, France. It was recorded by Rabbi Ephraim ben Yaakov of Bonn, a rabbi from the school of the Tosfists. What shall we say before God? What shall we speak? How can we justify ourselves? God must have found out our iniquity. In the year um, 
1171, evil appeared in France too, and great destruction in the city of Blois, with, in which at that time there lived about 40 Jews. It all happened on that evil day, Thursday towards evening, that the terror came upon us. A Jew, Isaac Bar Eleazar, rode up to water his horse, a common soldier, may he be blotted out of the book of life, was also there watering the horse of his master. The Jew bore on his chest an untanned hide, but one of the corners had become loose and was sticking out of his coat, when in the gloom the soldier's horse saw that the white side of the hide, saw the white side of the hide, it was frightened and sprang back, and it could not be brought to the water. So you wonder why do you wear uh, a piece of uh, untanned hide on your... It's because the sweat of your body goes into the hide, and it makes it more, uh, more, more supple, basically uh, softer. So um, it's, it's a way of treating it. If you're in the, in the leather business, people would wear uh, leather on, uh, like untanned leather on their uh, skin for a while. But it looks like skin. It looks like, you know, if it's, if it's light, it looks like human skin almost. Yeah. The Christian servant hastened back to his master and said, Hear, my lord, what a certain Jew did. As I rode behind him, behind him towards the river to give your horses a drink, I saw him throw a little Christian child, whom the Jews have killed, into the water. When I saw this, I was horrified and hastened back quickly for fear he might kill me too. Even the horse under me was so frightened by the splash of water when he threw the child that it would not drink. The soldier knew that his master would rejoice at the fall of the Jews because he hated a certain Jewess influential in the city. He as much as put the following words into his master's mouth. Now I can wreak my vengeance on that person, on that woman, Pusilina. Yeah, this is another example of... Uh... Uh, Jewish women who have Italian sounding names. You see that in the Middle Ages a lot. Okay. The next morning, the master rode to the ruler of the city, the cruel Theobald, son of Theobald, may his unrighteousness and bitter and may his unrighteousness and bitter evil curses fall upon his head. He was a ruler that listened to falsehood for his servants were wicked. Yeah, Theobald was actually named Theobald the Good, but not by the Jews, I'm sure. Uh-huh. When he heard this, he became enraged and had all the Jews of Blois seized and thrown into prison. But the dame Pulselina encouraged them all, for she, entrust, for she trusted in the affection of the ruler who up to now had been very attached to her. However, his cruel right, wife, a Jezebel, swayed him, for she also hated dame Pulselina. Yeah. All the Jews had been put into iron chains except Pulselina, but the servants of the ruler who watched her would not allow her to speak to him at all for fear she might get him to change his mind. The ruler was revolving in, in his mind all sorts of plans to condemn the Jews, but he did not know how. He had no evidence against them until a priest appeared, may he be destroyed and may his memory be uprooted from the land of the living who said to the ruler, come, I'll advise you how you can condemn them. Command that servant who saw the Jew throw the child into the river be brought here and let him be tested by the ordeal in a tank of water to discover if he has told the truth. The ruler commanded and they brought him, took off his clothes and put him into the tank filled with holy water to see what would happen. If he floated, his words were true. If he sank, he had lied. Such are the laws of the Christians who judge by ordeals, bad laws and customs by which one cannot live. The Christians arranged it in accordance with their wish so that the servant floated and that they took him out and thus declared the, right, the wicked innocent and the righteous guilty. Um, in this ordeal, the normal procedure appears to have been reversed. So generally the innocent sank and the guilty floated. Yeah. In both cases, of course, they were dead, right? The innocent sank. Oh, okay. He drowned. So he must have been guilty. He must have been innocent. Too bad for him. And uh, if he floated, then he got killed also. But yeah. Okay. That's called, uh, uh, yeah, that's called an ordeal. That's really an ordeal. An ordeal is, uh, we say, I went through an ordeal, but an ordeal is uh, supposedly um, a divine sign to test if somebody is, is, is true or, or not, or guilty or not. Ah, yes, please continue. The ruler had started negotiations for a money settlement before the coming of the priest who incited the ruler not to accept any ransom for the dead child. In the Middle Ages, many crimes could be exploited legally through money payment. He had sent someone to the Jews of the other communities and asked how much they would give him. The Jews consulted with their Christian friends and with the Jews in the dungeon, and these latter advised to, only, to offer only 100 pounds, and in addition to their collected, uncollected 
debts amounting to the sum of 180 pounds. The Jews objected to paying high ransoms to not make it profitable for the Christians to imprison Jews. Yeah. Okay. In the meantime, the priest arrived on the scene, and from this time on, the ruler paid no attention to the Jews and did not listen to them, but only to the instruction of the priest in the day of the wrath. Money could not help them. At the wicked ruler's command, they were taken and put into a wooden house, around which were placed thorn bushes and faggots. As they were led forth, they were told, save your lives, leave your religion, and turn to us. Yeah. <laughs> they mistreated them, beat them, and tortured them, hoping that they would exchange their glorious religion for something worthless, but they refused. Rather, did they encourage each other and say to one another, persist in the religion of the Almighty. At the command of the oppressor, they then took the two Jewish priests, the pious Rabbi Yehiel, the son of Rabbi David HaKohen, and the just Rabbi Yekutiel HaKohen. Very well. The, <laughs> the son of Rabbi Judah. Doing great. And tied them to a single stake in the house where they were to be burned. They were both men of valor, disciples of Rabbi um, Samuel and Rabbi Jacob, the grandsons of Rashi. They also tied the hands of Rabbi Judah, son of Aaron, and then set fire to the faggot. The fire spread to the cords on their hands so that they snapped and all three came out and spoke to the servants of the oppressor. The fire has no power over us. Why should we not go free? So if you believe in ordeal, this was often seen in the Middle Ages as, oh, the, the fire is a tool of God to punish, but the fire is actually uh, burning the, the ropes that they're tied off. So this is a sign that they're innocent. So they said, look, see, this is, this is how you rule your business now. We should be free. Since these three had, with, had withstood the ordeal by fire, they asked to be freed. The enemy answered, by our lives, you shall not get out. They kept on struggling to get out, but they were pushed back into the house. They came out again and seized hold of the Christian to drag him along with them back onto the fire. When, when they were right at the fire, the Christians pulled themselves together, rescued the Christian from their hands, killed them, and their, killed them with their swords, and then threw them into the fire. Nevertheless, they were not burnt, neither they nor all those, all those 31 persons. Only their souls were released by the fire. Their bodies remained intact. When the Christians saw it, they were amazed and said to one another, truly these are saints. Yeah. That, that could just be uh, part of the legend. It was seen as a sign that, uh, that the fire indeed did spare their bodies and left them intact and, in, uh, and, and, and honored their bodies uh, as, a, as a tribute to their innocence. So it's a, a bit of the same mindset as what the Christians in those days had. Yeah. A certain Jew by the name of Rabbi Baruch, the son of David HaKohen, was there and saw all this with his own eyes. He lived in the territory of that ruler and had come there to arrange terms for the Jews of Lloyd's, but because of our sins, he had no success. However, a settlement was made by him for 1,000 pounds to save other Jews of that accursed ruler. He also saved the scrolls of the Torah and the rest of their books. This happened in the year 4931 on Wednesday, the 20th of the month of Sivan. This day ought to be established as a fast day, like the fast of Gedalia. All these fasts were written down by the Jews of Orleans, a city close by that of the martyrs and made known to the teacher, our master, our master Rabbi Jacob, Rabbeinu Tam, who died in the third week of the boy burning. Mm -hmm. It was also reported in that letter that as the flames mounted high, the martyrs began to sing in unison a melody that began softly but ended with a full voice. The Christian people came and asked us, what kind of song is this? For we have never heard such a sweet melody. We knew it well, for it was the song. It is incumbent upon us to praise the Lord of all. Aleinu uh l'shebeach -huh. l'adon hakol. Yeah. This prayer, the Aleinu, is this, now recited daily, but it was then only uh, for uh, song on New Year, uh, Rosh Hashanah, and uh, soon New Year, and Yom Kippur. Yeah. Oh, daughters of Israel, weep for the 31 souls that were burnt for the sanctification of the name, and let your brothers, the entire house of Israel, be well burning. We'll finish the end of this story. Because of our sins, these men were not even given a Jewish burial, but were left at the bottom of the hill on the very spot where they had been burnt. It was only later that the Jews came and buried the bones. There were about 32 holy souls who offered themselves as a sacrifice to their creator. 
God smelled the sweet savor. Him whom he has chosen, he brings close to him. Of their own free will, all the communities of France, England, and the Rhineland observed Wednesday the 20th of Sivan, 4931, as a day of mourning and fasting. This was also the command of our great teacher, Jacob, the son of Rabbi Meir, who wrote letters to them informing them that it was proper to fix this day as a fast for all our people, and that it must be greater even in the fast of Gedalia ben Ahikam. It was to be like the Day of Atonement, 24 hour fast. Yeah, this is from, uh, that's the source. So uh, this rabbi, this was uh, Rabbi Nukam, right? He, he spoke about him, Jacob, the son of Meir. And yeah, uh, in Ashkenazi, uh, i.e. French and German uh, communities, for years that year has been, a, had been a day of fast. I don't think anymore. Um, okay, um, thank you so much. It's wonderful. Is Makaya here with us? Yeah. Hi, Makaya. So happy Hi. to hear you. Would you like to read uh, uh, an, an X number of slides? Yep. Good. Okay. The author, Rabbi Ephraim of Bonn, specifically mentions the scholars among the victims, like him, all from the school of Tosophists. Besides this report, there are other poems in commemoration of this event, all written by Tosophists as well. These Tosophists' poems identified the martyrs as holy and ideal martyrs. This following poem is by Rabbi Hillel of Bonn. He connects the death of the martyrs with the revelation on Mount Sinai and focuses on the martyrs being united and of one heart. When they heard this, they anonymously reconciled themselves to saying as one, we will obey and hearken as at Sinai. They are all one man's children. They would not deny God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is, your God is one. Deuteronomy 6.4. The youthful priests were bound in a pair, Yahio and Yehutiel, in priesthood and service. Together they were strengthened on the stake to be bound, they who were pleasing in their lives and in their death. When the fire reached the bonds of the priests' hands, the ties were severed from the men's hands. They cried out, the fire has tested us and we are innocent. The kings and princes of the earth were unmoved, Psalm 2-2. The, the last line is uh, often a, a quote from the Bible. Uh, the, the second uh, stanza, I couldn't find. It's probably a quote from something else, but um, that I haven't been able to find. Yeah. The tormentor's rage against them did not diminish. He commanded his servant to return them to the pyre. Beaten and wounded, they were struck with clubs and staves. Requite them, O Lord, according to their deeds. Lamentations 364. This sacrifice is a great sign and wonder that they should be glorified. The life was burned, but the body was not destroyed. Eyes saw and ears heard and wondered, a, ban a banner to wave for truth's sake, Selah, Psalm 66. Beautiful. So uh, poetically, it's, it's really beautiful, but the contents, of course, is, is, is pretty horrible. Yeah, there's another fragment of a bone, just a, a little piece of it. Uh, and similar, similar style. See the last line I did in italics, which is a, a quote. Mm -hmm. uh, you yourself redeem me, my redeemer, from the evil ones. Lifting up in consolation the reviled, the flagellated, and the burned, they who mention your holy name and delight in your faith. From the midst of the fire you hear the sound of speech, Deuteronomy 4 6. You, O Lord, can have compassion when I feel slaughtered in my bones by the ones who say, Where is your God? While striking my cheek, I hoped for protection, O living God, my promise. He spoke from the fire to us and we lived. Yeah, that's also, I couldn't find a text for that, but okay. Um, now, yeah, I'll read a little more if that's okay with you. Mm -hmm. Nice. In a few blood libel cases, it was acknowledged by the authorities that the allegations were false. For instance, in Bosing, now Pezinok, Slovakia, the charge was that a nine year old child had been bled to death and cruelly tortured. 30 Jews were tortured until they confessed. Later, the children were found alive in Vienna. It turned out that he was brought there by the Count Wolf of Basin, the same person who had accused the Jews in order to get rid of his creditors. Unfortunately, the Jews had already been burned alive. Yeah, this is a person who had uh, a big debt. He didn't want to pay it back. He didn't have the money. Maybe he spent it. So how do you get rid of your debtor, your creditor? Then um, say, oh, uh, you accused him of something. You rile up the population. 
and the people are killed and then you don't have to pay back your debt. But um, yeah, it was too late already when they found out the lie. The fact is that when you torture someone enough, he'll confess to anything to make the torture stop. Yeah. This is shown in a case where Jews confessed under torture that Jewish men, just like women, menstruate and that drinking Christian blood was their only cure. Yeah, if you torture somebody, they like to say that. And that's what happened in this case. So how ridiculous is that? Now the second, now we go to, this is general uh, ritual murder uh, libel. Now we'll go to uh, the blood libel. So it's really not about the torture, it's really about the blood. Um, I'll give you a few more slides and then we'll look for somebody else. Okay. We have seen allegations in the Middle Ages against Jews that they would ritually slaughter Christian children. The blood libel is a specific allegation that Jews would use Christian blood for their Passover rituals. Yeah. Passover has a lot to do with the Paschal lamb, Paschal, which in, Paschal, lamb. Yeah. Paschal lamb, which in the mind of medieval Christians refers to Jesus' crucifixion. In a weird parallel, Jews used to eat the Paschal lamb. And through the Eucharist, Christians believe that they eat the body of Christ, the Lamb of God. But while it is taught that in the Eucharist, the wine that is drunk has become Jesus' blood, this is where the parallel stops. Jews are not allowed to consume blood, and Judaism has no rituals with an imagery of consuming blood. That's quite different. Leviticus 17, 10 to 12. I will turn against any Israelite or any foreigner that lives among them who eats blood, and I will cut him off from the people, for the life of a creature is in the blood. Therefore, I say to the Israelites, none of you may eat blood, nor may any foreigner residing among you consume blood. So there are tribes, as you see here, that actually consume blood. And um, it's uh, protein, just like meat, but uh, you don't have to slaughter your cow. So it's... Uh, so it's, it saves your cattle in a way, but um, it's also very unhealthy because a lot of diseases could, could uh, but in any case, not something Jews do. Uh -huh. In some messed up way, it was believed that Jews were craving the blood of Jesus for murderous reasons. And with the lack thereof, they used Christian blood for their Passover rituals. In 1475, shortly before Easter, a Franciscan preacher dis delivered a sermon in the tr city of Trent in which he strongly vilified the local Jewish community. Around Easter, the two-year-old Simon goes miss missing. The story spread quickly that the Jews had drained him of his blood to bake it in their matzahs. The place where the body was found is not clear. Some reports say in a Jewish family's house, others say in a ditch. The entire Jewish community, both men and women, were arrested and forced to confess under torture. Fifteen of them, including the head of the community, were sentenced to death and burnt at the stake. The Jewish women accused as accomplices were tortured, but freed from prison in 1478 due to inter intervention of the Pope. The case at Trent also inspired accusations of ritual murder against Jews throughout the surrounding regions. Yeah. Um, like Okay, oh, well. do, uh, do one more then. Okay, Bishop de Sindiki, the investigator on behalf of the Pope, denied the martyrdom of the child Simon and disputed the occurrence of a miracle at his grave. When he demanded the immediate release of the Jews, he was condemned by the local ruler and had to flee from the attacking mob. So a serious uh, investigator on behalf of the Pope nonetheless, is almost lynched because he says this is not, didn't really happen. Thank you so much for reading. While he took the accused actual murderer as prisoner to Rome for trial, the local authorities continued their proceedings against the Jews, several of whom they executed. Yeah, so the, uh, the guy, the investigator had the actual murderer, who was not Jewish, uh, for trial. The trial, uh, the investigation is still going on, but the local rulers already um, start... Uh, burning the Jews who have been falsely accused, yeah? Meanwhile, Simon became the focus of attention within the local Catholic Church. The local Bishop of Trent tried to have Simon uh, canonized, declared a mar martyr, yeah. and a saint. 
yeah. producing a large body of documentation of the event and its aftermath. Over 100 miracles were directly attributed to St. Simon within a year of his disappearance, and his veneration spread across Italy, Austria, and Germany. He was eventually considered a martyr mar yeah, and a patron for a victim of, ki of kidnapping and torture. His entry in the old Roman calendar of saints for March 24 read, at Trent, the martyrdom of the boy Saint Simeon, who was barbaric, barbaric, uh, barbarically yeah. murdered by the Jews, who was afterwards glorified by many miracles. Simon was removed from the saint's calendar in 1965. And that should have been the end of it. In 1965, finally, the church says that it didn't happen and they took it away. And I thought that would be over. I taught this class a number of times. Now, but what happened this year? However, this year in 2020, an Italian painter named Giovanni Gasparo revived the blood libel by a grotesque and extreme anti-Semitic painting. He did, just this year, he came out with a painting of this uh, supposed... Uh, Ritual killing of Simon. It's amazing. This year. Uh, his painting is called Martyrdom of Saint Simon of Trento in accordance with Jewish ritual murder. Can you believe it? It's uh, unbelievable. Ah, so very, very good. Um, we're going to now um, look at uh, something quite unique. A very interesting and unexpected source is found in the 500-year-old Haggadah. Uh -huh. A Haggadah is a guide for the Passover celebration. Yeah, so when it's Passover, Pesach in Hebrew, uh, there's a Haggadah, which is, a, let's say, a, a guide, a booklet that people follow, and that's, that's the celebration, step yes. by step, which you do what it is. Um, yeah. Uh, the text of Haggadah has been pretty standard for many centuries, but it often comes with nice illustrations in recent history with different commentaries. Yeah, there's all these very different Haggadah. Haggadahs, but that's the commentary on the on the text of the Haggadah. The Haggadah itself is almost entirely standardized. Mm -hmm. The Haggadah that I am referring to has been recently discovered and is known as the monk's Haggadah. Yeah, so what does a monk have to do with the Haggadah? It's only discovered a few years ago. Um, this particular Haggadah has some very unusual features. It has Latin marks in the margins. Yeah, here you see it on the left of the Hebrew, that is Latin, uh, very uh, unusual for Haggadah. Um, there is a long introductory explanation and commentary also in Latin. Some of the illustrations have Christian features. Yeah, so here's the commentary in Latin. Mm -hmm. um, extremely unusual and contrary to Jew Jewish principles is the fact that there's a depiction of God. This drawing is connected to a text about God's outstretched hand holding a sword. Yeah, here it is in, uh, enlarged. It is not uncommon in a Haggadah to have a picture of an arm with a sword in this place, but never a physical image of God. Moreover, God looks a bit like medieval images of Jesus. Yeah, see uh, the image on the left, top left, that is a uh, detail from that Haggadah depicting God. And see that uh, blonde, long hair, and then this, this split beard, see? Uh, that, uh, you see that in medieval uh, paintings. I, um, so it's, it's very much a Christian style uh, picture. And then? And on top of that, he is pointing three fingers as if giving a traditional Christian uh, benediction. Three fingers are in this context, a sign of the Trinity. His sword has the shape of a cross. The contours are even accentuated with gold. Yeah. Uh, notice what God is sitting on. It looks like an image of a coffin commonly used in depictions of Jesus' uh, resurrection. Yes, yeah, so it's exactly the same image. So he, this God looks like Jesus, sits on a, on a coffin uh, like Jesus, and blesses as all the pictures of Jesus. So basically this God, you could say, is Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, and these resurrected Jesus images have the same position of the three fingers. See all these, these images, all two, or there, there's many more, but that would be a bit messy on the page. Now there's another... 
and all the images of the resurrected Jesus, he is holding a cross. God in the Haggadah is not holding a cross, but the sword in his hand has the shape of a cross, purposely outlined with gold. Yeah, very nice. Okay, and then? Um, compare this image to one of Jesus on Judgment Day. Sword, split beard, pointed fingers. The hidden message is perhaps that the God of the Jews is the same as the resurrected Christ who will judge those who crucified him. Very well. How did this end up in a Jewish Haggadah? Haggadah? Haggadah. The story behind this Haggadah is hard to reconstruct and not entirely clear. Roughly, the following seems to be a plausible possibility. In 1475, a Jew ordered a Haggadah to be made in the area of South Germany slash Austria. The printing press was just barely invented. Most books, including Haggadahs, were written and illustrated by hand. And that's why you call manuscripts. Manu means manual, script. So manuscript is something written by hand. Yeah. Phase one. The text was written, in this case, in truly beautiful, artful script. Yeah. Then phase two. The scribe started to add the vowels, but did not finish it. Uh-huh. Three. An artist starts adding illustrations. Yeah. Let's look at some of the illustrations. This is the first illustration in the Haggadah, the blessing over the first cup of wine. Yep. When we look closer, the man who blesses the cup of wine is making the same gestures as a Catholic priest when he gives a blessing. Also the three fingers, see that? This is a man to the right and a woman to the left, both holding a matzah. This illustrates the phrase, ha lahma anya. Which means? This is the bread of affliction that our forefathers ate in the land of Egypt. But once again, the man blesses the bread the Catholic way. In this illustration, the Hebrew slaves are building the cities for Pharaoh. Yeah, no deeper meaning. It's just a, a cute little illustration. The passage that follows the picture of men building praises certain people who recounted the story of the exodus from Egypt throughout the entire night until dawn. The next passage concludes, the sages have said, you shall recount the story of the exodus all the days of your life in this age, but even until the Messiah comes to die. Yeah, comes to die, that is the interpretation of the commentator because that's not uh, really a... Um, what you Jews look forward to, uh, that the Messiah dies for their sins. Is it possible to argue that we see here the ancient longing for the coming of Christ and even of eternal redemption through his death and for the, the cessations of the ritual and the eating of the foreshadowed lamb because of that true lamb who takes away the sins of the world? And even of eternal redemption through his death. His death, he put that in himself <laughs> in the commentary. Uh, that wasn't there. But he puts it in himself and says, I see, they also long for the death. Let's go to the next slide. There, immedi <clears throat> there immediately follows a blessing for the place where the exodus is retold and for those who retell it. Now, let me interrupt. There is something called Baruch HaMakom uh, as part of the Haggadah. And um, that literally means blessed is the place. But it is Hebrew. And in, in this context, HaMakom doesn't mean the place. It means the God who is in every place, meaning the omnipresence. So uh, he doesn't, uh, the commentator who, uh, who writes in, in Latin, once again, doesn't really understand it. He thinks it's actually the blessing of the place where the Haggadah is read. But okay, no problem, uh, as long as we know that. Mm -hmm. This is its translation. Bless in the place and those through whom the Exodus is retold. Bless is the Lord who gave the law to Israel. Blessed is the man who expounds the law in the presence of his four children, one of whom is wise, another wicked, a third simple, and one who does not know what to ask. Yeah, okay. So look at these. The wise son, oh, oh wait, there, wait. Yeah? there are four sons in the Haggadah, the wise son, the evil son, the simple son, and the ignorant son. The evil son looks like a knight. Yeah, see, like a, like a medieval, uh, like a crusader almost. Mm-hmm. They, the three most important topics of the Passover ritual are the Passover sacrifice, no illustration, matzah, the unleavened bread, maror, 
maror, bitter herbs. So this is the image of uh, matzah. And, and thank you so much for reading. I will, uh, uh, I will deliver you from, uh, from this work. And I'll see if someone else is here. This picture accompanies a section about um, more oh, no. oh, no. uh, bitter herbs. The bitter herbs are eaten as a reminder of the bitterness the Israelites endured in Egypt. But if we look closer, yeah. it is customary at this point to point at the bitter leaves. But in this picture, the man is pointing at his wife. As this source of his bitterness. I guess that's a joke. Uh, so, all right. Towards the end of ha ha Haggadah, the text from Psalms reads, pour, pour your wrath upon the nations that do not know you and on the kingdom that do not call upon your name. The Latin com commemorator writes in his... Oh, the Latin commentator writes in his introduction, as the Jews of Trent confessed, they understood the word nations refers to Christianity and kingdoms refers to power and rule. Yeah, so the Jews of Trent confessed, we already saw Trent. That was, uh, Trent was the, uh, where this uh, boy Simon was uh, found and the Jews were um, tortured and confessed. So they tortured, so there's a lot of, uh, you'll see later that this Latin commentator was in Trent when the Jews were interrogated and tortured and got all these confessions uh, under force. And so he feels that he um, has some really inside information about Jews, what Jews really do. So they, 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 they tortured them about uh, who is this um, Porter Rat on the Nathans? Isn't that the Christians? No, not the Christians. Ah, is it the Christians? No. Ah, yes. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that's how it's, that's how it's, uh, I'm sure it went. And so he thinks, ah, I was there and they confessed. Can you believe that people actually thought that you get some real information from torture? So, uh, okay. Yeah, continue. This, <clears throat> this image of a horseman represents a vision through which some signify that on this night, the Messiah, whom they continue to await, has arrived on, th on this night of Passover. And once the meal has ended and the dining room has opened, some give welcome to the Christ as if he were just arriving. Yeah, Christ and Messiah, same word. Now look, you see, there's many of these, sign, of these uh, images we saw, that uh, the, the Messiah on his horse, this point he had, I pointed it out before, that was what Jews were uh, obligated to wear in the Middle Ages, in many places in the Middle Ages. So these pointy hats with a bulb on top, you see here, um, once again, that, that's, that's that. When you put that on somebody's hat in the Middle Ages, that means he's a Jew. Okay. Yeah. Some, some of the vowels were added after or during most of the illustrations were added. What... What is the history behind the remarkable uh, Haggadah? In my understanding, this is what might be the story behind the monks Haggadah. The monks Haggadah, right. Okay, this is, I think, what happened. Yes. In 1478, the Jews in uh, Pasua, Pasau, where, where the Haggadah was at the moment, were accused of a host desecration. Yeah. Some of the Jews are burned alive on the stake. Others are expelled or converted in order to save their lives. Yes. Around the same time, a certain cleric of the church called Paul Wan was in uh, Passau. Paul dies in 1493, and he donates his large book collection to a uh, Benedictine monastery. Benedictine monastery in the town of Teganze. In Teganze. Very good. Uh, among his books was was his Haggadah, which he had probably acquired at the time of the Pasu po Pasau 
pogrom. So when the when the, when the people were murdered in Passau, right here, uh, a host desecration. You know what that is. You see an image of stabbing a host, uh, the, the body of Christ symbolically. So uh, all the people had been murdered because they were accused of that. And so people took their possessions, and he had acquired the Haggadah at that time. Convenient. Uh huh. The monks in the monastery sent the Haggadah to a Dominican scholar called Edward von Poppenheim. Edward von Poppenheim. Yeah. Von Poppenheim sent it back with a long letter of explanation in Latin and with some explanations in the margin. The letter was bound together with the Haggadah and voila. So, yeah, so these, uh, these monks that, that, that were donated this Haggadah, so this is special, but we don't understand it. We don't understand the Hebrew and we don't understand what this means. They send it to Erard from Pappenheim and he writes this whole uh, explanation and commentary on it and it's bound together. And this is what we call the, the, the monk Haggadah. But we still do still some puzzling aspect. It's still not really clear because... There is still the question of the Christian style pictures in the Haggadah and more so the fact that some of the vowels were added after the pictures were finished. Would a Jewish scribe ignore the Christological imagery and work around it? Yeah, a Jewish scribe. Would a Jewish scribe... Uh, would some, who would write these Christian-style images and then a Christian scribe would actually say, yeah, that's a nice idea. I'm going to finish it, even though there's all these Christian things in that. So this might be the explanation. The most likely possibility is the Haggadah was still unfinished when Paul Juan acquired it. Juan possibly had a Christian artist do the pictures, after which he may have commissioned one of the newly converted Jews to finish co- calligraphy. Yeah. Edward von Poppenheim, by the way, had been present at the blood, blood, the, at blood, the blood libel trial of Trent in 1477. 75, so he had tortured, he had heard tortured Jews confess to some of the notions and crimes that he described in his explanations. Because of these confessions, von Poppenheim believed he had reliable first-hand information. Yeah, which is, of course, very much doubtful. In his letter, he describes a list of parallels between the Jewish Passover celebration and the Christian Eucharist Eucharist. ritual. Ritual. Yeah. Um, Okay. You know what? Um, Yeah, just do... Maybe do two more, and then the rest I will... Pick out another, uh, another victim. Yeah. He writes that even though the Haggadah did not mention it, Jews use the blood of Christian infants during their ceremony between the wine and the matzah. Both in the wine and the matzah. Right. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, is there anyone who here present who didn't read yet? Because there's a long I didn't. Time. Who did? Rachel. Hey, Rachel. Okay, Rachel, thank you so much. And I'm going to uh, go to the next slide with you. When he describes the pouring of the first cup, he writes, I find it puzzling that they, that they do not prepare a lamb, even though the law itself commands that a lamb be sacrificed every year and eaten at the supper throughout all their generations based on an eternal covenant. So, Rachel, can you explain to me why they why uh, Jews do not eat a lamb on, on Passover? Um, from what I understand, the tradition is that you don't do it unless we have the temple. So um, that's almost hundred percent true. But you do not need the temple to, to do it. Actually, after the temple was destroyed, it was done for a while. But it, but it has to eat it in Jerusalem, and it has to be slaughtered on the temple mountain. So you can actually you don't each actually need the temple for it, but access to the temple mountain. So even though there's no temple, there's still there's Jews in, in Jerusalem every year who come with a lamb to the Temple Mountain, and they're stopped by the police because that would uh, upset the Muslims who uh, are in charge of the Temple Mountain, and it's not allowed, but technically you could do it, but you have to be in Jerusalem for that. Okay, so uh, thanks, that was good, that was good. Mm -hmm. Once they have set the table with all the items, the leader of the household sits at the head of the table with his chalice filled with wine before him. Then, as the Jews of Trent told in their confession, he takes a single drop from another chalice full of Christian blood 
and putting it in his wine, he says, this is the blood of a Christian child. Once his own wine is mixed with the blood, he pours a drop into every other chalice. Then when he is ready to recite the blessing, the head of the household raises his cup and the others raise their own cups as they're about to hear the blessing be recited. Yeah, isn't that something? So it's interesting. He makes a parallel because in the Christian uh, Catholic Church, they have the wine, they say the blessing, and then they give somebody to drink. They say, this is the blood of Christ. We don't say this is the blood. We don't believe that it's blood. It's just wine, and let alone blood of a Christian child. So he put that in. But it must be something that the people have uh, were, were, were forced to say on the torture. So that's his information. Uh, actually, in... Uh, in Ashkenazi lands, I don't know if it's still there, it's still a tradition, but it has been a tradition since this to always on Passover use white wine so it doesn't look like blood. Just to make sure that somebody sees it will not say, look, you're drinking blood, just white wine. Um, interesting. Yeah, okay. If there's fresh Christian blood available, they will sprinkle some drops into the dough depending on how much he has. And even though only one drop is sufficient, if he has no fresh blood, the leader grinds dried blood into powder and then rehydrates it and sprinkles it. The Jews of Trent, during their confessions, admitted that murdering Christian children and consuming their blood is not necessary, but that they only do it for the hatred for Christ. They never write these things down, but only pass this custom to the most loyal people. Oh, so upsetting. All right. Yeah. I was yeah. exceedingly amazed, and still am on this day, that the, this uh, most pitiful people observe so many customs with such great diligence, and yet seems to pay no attention to the Paschal, Is that Paschal, so good? Lamb. Paschal Lamb. Okay. In fact, the Jews of Trent confess that the eating of the lamb has been changed into drinking oh. the blood of Christian children. I've seen it's this crazy. so often, and, and I'm so upset every time I go to this class. Oh, yeah? Okay. It's praiseworthy and brings complete forgiveness of sins so that oh. they may, they can check, mock, deceive, murder, and bring any sort of evil upon Christians. Oh, boy. Yeah. Whenever an objection is raised from the Torah against the shedding of an innocent blood, they claim that they have been taught by their elders that these prohibitions apply to the blood of animals, not the blood of Christians. Yeah, so there are still so many people who, who, who spread this. I, I, a bunch of years ago, my son was lives in Holland, and he was working with people, and they don't know. He's not Jewish because I converted, and he did not. Uh, and, um, but, you know, so he told me, um, this, this person he's working with started telling everybody, you know, Jews, they kill Christians. And they, and my, my son said, uh, and they, that's, that's nonsense. It's not true. Oh yeah. Look on the internet. You can find it everywhere. So these, these things are, they go around. Yeah. At the Passover supper, they set out, they set out three pieces of prescribed unleavened bread. We at the supper of the Holy Sacrament divide a single piece into three, thereby representing the Trinity. Yeah. The head of the household raises up the unleavened bread, shows it to all, saying, this is the unleavened bread. So too Christ turned the bread into his holy body, showed it to the disciples, and said, this is my body. And we do the very same thing every day when we raise up the sacred host and show it to all of Christ's, Christ's faithful. Yeah, so uh, it's true. There are definitely parallels because the Eucharist comes from the Last Supper of Jesus and the Last Supper of Jesus was on Passover. So there are uh, parallels, but uh, also many differences, right? Mm -hmm. Similarly, the head of the household blesses and raises the chalice while showing it to his brothers and says, this is the cup of the blood of a Christian child, as certain men have admitted. Christ did the same thing, saying this is the cup, etc. And so we do as well. Yeah, as certain men have admitted. Now we already know what that means. Uh huh. Unfortunately, the myth still lives on. If you look online, you can find much evidence of anti-Semitic groups and individuals that promote the idea uh, that groups and individuals that promote the idea. The Jews are literal vampires who require the literal blood of other human races in order to perpetuate their race. Yeah, I found this uh, see three years ago on the internet. Uh huh. The blood libel myth has been propagated into recent history in Islamic countries. Yeah, it's hopefully getting a little less, but um, a few years ago. A few years ago, there was a TV show in Syria called Ash Sha'ata. Shatat, which means the, the diaspora. Which in, in which there was a scene of a ritual slaughter of a Christian child. Yeah, it, it, it takes uh, very little, but here it is. Sma, bidna dam tofil masihi, 
قبل الفصح مشان الفطير ما تعصر دماغك كثير جوزيف ابن الين جارتكم جوزيف طب ليش جوزيف بالذات يعني؟ بعدين فهمك نفذ اولا نتان تقدير فعلا انا بلشت اقلق اذا حدا شك بنلغي العمليه وبنخلي نتان يقول انه جاب جوزيف لعندك لهون مجرد مشوار شلوم شلوم هذا شافكم؟ لا متاكد؟ طبعا معناتها خلينا نبدا فورا نتان بدي اروح على البيت تكرم حبيبي بعد شوي بنروح لا تخاف رجالي لا تخاف لا تخاف the most um, enjoyable thing to watch. And can you believe like a whole nation is watching this? Ay, ay, ay. Okay, so this is another here, something else, um, Rachel. When I was a student in Leiden, I took a course in Yiddish. And one of my classmates who was a retired Jewish pharmacist and a Holocaust survivor, he told me that he had a Muslim neighbor with whom he was very friendly. He and his other, he and their neighbors would walk in and out of each other's home freely. One day during Pesach, he and his wife were having breakfast and ate, according to Dutch custom, matzah with butter and sugar. The neighbors walked in and wished them happy holidays. My friend asked the neighbors if they wanted matzah also. They declined because in our religion, we are not allowed blood. Yeah, so that was, and he was shocked. He, told, he came to the And now um, this is the last slide. And this is, uh, here, this is in Amsterdam on the, in the center. Wat sprak tot Abraham en zei, ik zal jou een grote gooi maken. Ik zal het een groot volk maken. Ja. En dat zijn wij geworden. Wij christenen zijn met miljarden. Want Jezus Christus heeft de joden vervloekt en nu zijn wij het volk van, de, uh, van God. Vervloekt. Want jullie hebben hem aan het kruis gehangen en het bloed van Jezus Christus is op u en uw kinderen. Dat is het, Thessalonicense 2,15. De Joden zijn de vijand van alle mensen. Synagoge des Satans, dat is jullie vijand. En ons maar zien als beesten. Ik zeg u, meneer de Jan, uiteindelijk gaan wij gooien. Gaan wij eens zien wat jullie doen. En dan is het niet meer zo heel lang dat jullie nog met dit soort uh, dingen rond kunnen lopen. Dat zeg ik u. Want de gooien weten. En ze weten veel meer dan dat u denkt. En dit land draait om. Binnen een paar jaar, binnen een paar jaar, heeft niemand meer oog voor jullie, want we zien het, de waarheid komt naar buiten. Weet je, het zal moeten aan te leugen. Ja, u, hoor, ik, ik, ja u, 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 u bent bang. U weet dat ik iets weet dat eigenlijk niet voor gooien is om te weten, hè, over de Talmud. Dat is verboden, dat mag ik niet eens weten. Volgens die Talmud zou ik nu dood moeten, hè. Yeah. yeah, not so great. In any case, uh, we fit all the 127 slides in. It's pretty amazing. Um, this is also not uh, the best uh, slide. Uh, 
we did really well in that respect. Of course, I am always shaky after this. It's like uh, crazy. What can we say? Here is, uh, there was the first slide, the Jew with horns. Um, ah, we have uh, eight more minutes. I have a friend who uh, is French, and he uh, was a professor at the Sorbonne, actually. Uh, very young, brilliant. And, um, and he, uh, but he went to uh, like a Latin, a Catholic uh, elite school. And, um, and he was, uh, and he's a chazan also. He's uh, like a, a cantor. And he was with friends from school and he said, um, I have a, a service, I'm going to synagogue now. And one of the person says, ah, you're going to do your blood rituals, huh? And he says, what blood rituals? This is nonsense. He says, uh, don't believe that. And yeah, yeah, I know. He said, oh, if you don't believe me, come with me. You'll see for yourself what we do. Ah, but then you'll just won't do it because I am there. And then and somebody else, uh, uh, Someone else uh, later, he met somebody, uh, a girl, and she said, and she was very nice to him, but then she said, I always had a question. I don't know if you uh, would be insulted if I ask, but you're Jewish. He said, yeah. And he, she said, I never know. Where do you hide your horns? This is an elite school. which is supposedly intelligent people. And he, dumb, I wouldn't have never said that because but he was so sick and tired of it. He said, I filed them. <laughs> so <laughs> ridiculous. But in any case, uh, horrible. These things are going around. In fact, that, you know, that painting that I just showed you, that just, uh, uh, that, that just came out this year, is uh, very concerning. So I hope if any one of you is ever uh, confronted with uh, these kind of libels, that you'll do a good word and say, no, I'm, I know Jews, I did a Jewish class, and it's really based on, uh, it's, it's totally nonsense, and uh, I don't believe it, and it's not true. And I know, I had a professor who was Jewish, and um, I liked him, I hope you like me. <laughs> In any case, everybody, uh, this was it. We're gonna end the class, and um, thank you for your attention. <laughs>